Well, thank you, Fritz. And let me just say that Fritz played an absolutely instrumental role in for me to join here. And um, thank you for that. And uh, you know, it's it's always hard to you know know you know Berkeley and Stanford both great institutions. And during big game, I just stay quiet. <laughs> it's very hard for me to go either way. Um, it's too quick, too soon. Yeah. But um, delighted to be here. Um, I thought I'll, I'll talk about the decarbonization of our energy system, because I think that's in everyone's mind. Uh, as was mentioned, there's a COP21 meeting in Paris, which I'm so glad it's still going to go on, uh, you know, despite what has happened. It's terrific to send that message. Um, and the whole idea of that meeting is about decarbonization. And, but before I go there, I just want to reflect on a little bit of the history of our energy system. And you have to only go back about 250 years, which seems like a long time. But in the history of human, humankind, it's just a blip. And 250 years was approximately the rough, roughly the time when the United States was being created. It was, a, um, it was when all the documents that we all cherish were being written. And if you imagine what life was like at that time, um, we only have sort of paintings and pictures of depictions of what life was like. This is how we traveled. Uh, this is how we lit our homes using whale oil. Whale, whaling was a huge industry because it provided the oil for lighting, amongst other things. And we used to travel in horse carriages. Humans used to travel in horse carriages um, with two horses across the continent that would take you know, more, than a, more than a month. And so that was life, and at that time, you know, Washington and Jefferson all could never imagine the life that we live today. That, you know, the, the, uh, these lights, the, the planes and, and automobiles, and this is what we have today. We go to a grocery store with not two horses, but 300 horses. And the more the better, right? That's what we do. And we fly across the continent with 100,000 horses in a matter of five or six hours that used to take more than a month. And no one could have imagined this 250 years ago. Not even Nostradamus. And this is what, what I would like to call the Industrial Revolution is about horsepower to horsepower. And in, instead of lighting with whale oil, we have the electricity grid, which has been termed as the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. And this has led to an amazing, amazing uh, change in our quality of life and quality of, our, uh, of, of health, et cetera. And these have led to what I call global exponentials. The GDP per capita has gone up exponentially. And it has, if you look at the population, it's also gone up almost exponentially. It was 700 million people in the world in, in, uh, before the Industrial Revolution. Today we have 7 billion. And it's, it's uh, predicted to go up to about 10 billion with an uncertainty of 10 billion. But nevertheless, it's going to be on the order of about 10 billion. It's going to be a lot of people by the end of the century. And of course, the GDP per capita is very well correlated with the energy that we use. And in fact, it has been enabled by the energy. Without that, it would not have happened. And it's been mostly about um, fossil energy, coal, gas, and oil. And more recently, with a little bit of nuclear. And the biomass has always been there. And maybe it has gone up a little bit. And as we all know, the impact of this use of fossil energy has led to an exponential increase in the concentrations of atmospheric CO2. It turns out that the rate of emission has gone up roughly linearly. 
And the lifetime of CO2 molecules in the atmosphere is a few hundred years. So the CO2 molecules that were emitted during James Watt steam engine time, some of them, many of them are still there. So it's like a big capacitor. So if the rate is linear, um, you can imagine the amount of concentration is, is the area under the curve, which is sort of quadratic. And you can sort of see that growth in CO2 concentrations. And of course, this is the big challenge of our lifetime of several generations to come. And the question that everyone is asking is, how do we decarbonize our energy system and still continue our economic growth? People think it's mutually exclusive. And the, the big challenge of a lifetime is, how do we make it mutually inclusive? because no one wants to go away from that exponential economic growth, but you still want to decarbonize. So of course, there is no one solution for this. There's no magic bullet in this. And it's not hundreds. So I said, I will invoke one of the greatest American philosophers who seems to have retired. I don't know why. Seems to have retired. One of the greatest American philosophers which is David Letterman, <laughs> and come up with the top 10 list of game-changing energy innovations. And he used to have sort of 10, um, the, the first, the, the last one, or the first one as being the most uh, amusing one, but I'm going to put it in no particular order. And this is my choice. I think all of you should have your own pet top 10 list. And maybe it'll be about 20 or so, eventually, because there'll be a lot of overlap. Well, let me pose my top 10 list. And we can discuss that later on. So number 10. So I, I wish I had Paul Schaefer to give the drum roll. <laughs> I, won't, I won't have that. So here's the thank you. Number 10 is a carbon capture from coal-fired power plants at a cost of less than $30 a ton with a price on carbon of more than $40 a ton. If the cost is less than the price, then there's business. Otherwise, people just pay the penalty. Now, the, the piece in blue is a policy effort, innovation that we need to have. There are lots of ways of getting there. But I'm just putting out there as a policy. But the technology to get the cost below the price is critically important. Otherwise, things are not going to move. That's number 10. Number nine, photovoltaic systems that are lighter and more efficient, enabling fully installed cost of less than 50 cents a watt with a levelized cost of less than 2.5 cents per kilowatt hour. 50 cents a watt. So when we were in DOE, we created something called the Sunshot Initiative, which was by the end of this decade, we want to reduce the cost of solar, fully installed cost, to be a dollar a watt. Simple to understand. Dollar a watt is equivalent to about five cents a kilowatt hour, unsubsidized. And looks like it may actually get there, which is amazing. At that time, it was thought to be audacious. The solar industry said, you guys are smoking something in DOE. <laughs> but they came around and said, it's possible now. So that's number nine. <clears throat> Let's move on. Number eight, battery storage at a capital cost of less than $100 a kilowatt hour and run more than 1,000 thousand cycles. If you could do that, this is game changing, absolutely game changing. We don't have that. And I'll tell you where we are today. Modular nuclear plants with um, construction at a capital cost of less than $3 a watt. So that the levelized cost of electricity is on the order of seven or eight cents a kilowatt hour. Now, today, the cost of nuclear plant, and most of the cost is construction cost. It's not the fuel cost. It's about 7 or $8 or more, sometimes north, with log, lots of delays, et cetera. And if you could reduce the cost below $3 a watt, it's a big deal. Number six, deep borehole geothermal energy with a levelized cost of about 7 or $0.08 cents or $0.06 cents a kilowatt hour. Deep borehole, so that the places that you could use geothermal is much more than few places where you have thermal gradients. Number five, ultra high voltage transmission lines and low cost integration of intermittent renewables at greater than 50% penetration. 
The grid was never designed for it, 50% renewables. So if he could do this, both a combination of long distance ultra high voltage transmission lines and low cost of integration, this will be great. Building performance standards combined with design materials, sensors, and control system that significantly reduce the building energy consumption. And the one in blue, again, is a policy. We have building codes, and I'll show you what the uh, building codes have been great, but that's only for design. You gotta be able to measure what it is and see the actual performance. And between the design and the measurement, there's a lot of slip between that cup and the lip. Number four, this is now going to the transportation side, internal combustion engines with more than 50% efficiency with multi-fuel mixtures. Number two, use of carbon-free energy to transform CO2 into hydrocarbon fuel, to reuse, recycle the CO2, and make it fuel at $2 a gallon cost, so they can compete with oil at $50 or $40 a barrel. And number one, genetic engineering that reduces the cost and simplifies the conversion of biomass into chemicals and fuels, okay? So again, none of these individually will solve all your problems, but collectively we may. I'm sure you have a few more. We can ta talk about it later on. This is, you know, I just thought we'll put it. I'm not gonna talk about all of them. It's impossible. You'll be here for a long time, but I'll talk about three. And I'll give you some trends of how close we are with the other ones. These are all individually very, very challenging problems. Let me show you where we are with, with, uh, with wind. This is the power purchase agreement, which is actual business contracts that have been signed for wind. And, and you, as you can see, it's at about $20 a megawatt hour. These are business contracts signed for long-term contracts. This is with a production tax credit of $23 a megawatt hour. So if you remove the production tax credit, it's at about $43 a megawatt hour. What does that mean? Relative to what? Relative to US natural gas and China coal. It's actually lower right now. Relative to US coal and nuclear. Okay, so wind is pretty cheap. In terms of electricity generation, this is not, there's no integration. This is just purely generation. And of course you're seeing the high penetration of wind. It's at about 70 gigawatts right now. The whole US power capacity is at about, a, is about terawatts, one terawatt. So you're at about you know, six, 7% right now, which is not bad. China is a little ahead. And here is where the solar is, that it, the cost is coming down and steadily, and it keeps on coming down because there's a lot of headroom in the efficiency as well as the, the weight, light weighting of the solar panel. Most of the cost is not in the panel. It's in the balance of system, is the installation. So if you make it more efficient and lighter, the total cost comes down. And there's plenty of headroom still left. And so this cost of, these are actually, again, business contract, down to about $40 a megawatt hour that was signed this year or end of last year. And this is with an investment tax credit of 30%, which will go down to about 10%, not about, it'll go down to 10% starting 2017. Okay, so the subsidies are gonna go down, but at some point, the subsidy should go away when it is fully compatible, which is competitive. And if you look at the penetration, it's going up. It's at about 1% right now, but it's exponential growth. It's still small, small percentages. The biggest change that has happened in the electricity system is the introduction of natural gas, because it's really cheap. It can integrate into the grid, and it is a, one of the lowest forms. It's displacing coal. And, and that's decarbonizing in that way. Storage, where are we today? This is a lithium ion battery storage, and this is battery pack. And the vertical axis is dollars per kilowatt hour. And today, if you look at the battery packs, the filled circle is the battery pack from Nissan, and the open green circles are, is the battery pack from, from Tesla. It turns out that they are the best in packaging. And the cost has come down by a factor of three in the last seven years, which is amazing. No one had predicted this. And what we are finding now is that it's at about $350 a kilowatt hour. And it's all happened due to innovation in materials, in the cathode, in the anode, 
uh, some of it coming out from here at Stanford, um, and in the electrolyte. So the voltage range, range has increased. You can store more lithium because most of the cost is in the materials. So if you use less materials for the same amount of kilowatt hours, it costs less. And that combined with packaging innovation has brought it down by a factor of three. $350 a kilowatt hour, if it goes below $100 a kilowatt hour, it's a game changer, not just for transportation, for stationary storage. And people are predicting that at $150 a kilowatt hour, the range of about 200 miles range or 250 miles range, that range and the cost of the car will be competitive with the gasoline-based cars. And that, if you look at the lines, it's going to, you know, that's going to happen about 2025 or so. It's, you know, Tesla is going to get cheaper. And uh, hopefully there'll be a, you know, $20,000 car that people can buy. And, and it takes about 20 years for the fleet to turn over. So from 2025, add another 20 years, 2045 or so, which, you know, about 2050, we'll see high penetration, likely to see high penetration of storage of battery electric cars. Of course, this is not going to run planes, at least not as of now. It doesn't seem like it. Planes and trucks and all that, you still need liquid fuels, and I'll come back to that. So this is all good news. The another good news is LED lighting. And this is, as opposed to Moore's law, this is called Haight's law. And this has come down in dollars per kilolumens. It's come down dramatically to the point that this red line is $2 per kilolumen, which is the cost of compact fluorescence lamps. Okay? And this is incandescent lamp. But people have been switching to CFLs. And now we are almost getting there. That red dot that you see, that's a six pack of LEDs that I bought from Amazon. And I did the numbers, and it came out there. So it's getting there. In the next few years, you're going to see this to be cost competitive. Great news. And you see the adoption of that exponentially increase. So this is all great news. Let me tell you what the challenges are. So in a building, you can have extremely efficient appliances, like refrigerators, LED lighting, et cetera. But frankly, that's not good enough. I'll show you one example of that, actually two examples. One is a building, and I, I don't want to pick on any campus, <laughs> but here's the data from a campus, UPenn campus. Okay, I hate to do this at a, at a university. I can do it in a company. But here it is. You see the blue lines is cooling load, the okay, amount of cooling, and the red lines are heating. So this is Philadelphia, as you all know. In summer, in the middle of summer, July, August, it's hot and humid, and the cooling load is high. In the middle of winter, it's freezing, the heating load is high. As you can imagine, it must be a surprise to people that in the middle of summer, you have a heating load, and in the middle of winter, you have air conditioning running. What the heck is going on? And this is what I call a system level thing. You can have the most efficient heat and the most efficient air conditioner, doesn't matter. Because what often happens is you have a set point, and it, if you are running an air conditioner in the middle of summer, it cools down so much that you've got to turn on the heater again. And in the, in the middle of in a winter, you know, you have so, you got heating, but so hot, the air conditioner comes on because you have a set point. The system is not taken into account, and you're almost, it's like driving your car with one foot on the accelerator, the other foot on a brake. Okay? And now you think you're going fast, but you're not. You're really pressing hard on both, and you're dissipating. And that's what happens in buildings. And this is, so, you know, and if you think that this is only in UPenn campus, you'll be mistaken. This is probably going on out here, too. And we don't know because we don't measure. And let me show you something which was striking to me. We all know about lead buildings, right? Lead rated buildings, platinum, gold. Well, let me show you the data of the actual performance. And here's the data. Those are the platinum and gold. This is silver, and this is certified, which is like the lowest level, right? And what you find is that, on an average, yeah, it's a little bit better if you have gold and platinum. But in reality, the data is all over. It doesn't correlate with the actual lead rating. And you can be at a building platinum way over there, 
much worse than a certified building out here. And people at one time were trying to get to zero net energy building, which is a good idea. But let me tell you what happens in zero net energy buildings. On the vertical axis is the ratio of the actual measured performance to the design intent. And the x-axis is the design intent. So going this way is towards zero net energy. And guess what happens? The deviation from the design goes up almost by a factor of three. It goes up as you try to get to zero. So this, if you actually look at the real performance, this is, a, this is not good. Because you can put, as I said, as many really efficient appliances, but if you don't take, take care of the system, it can, it can fight with itself. So we have some real challenges out here. So building codes are great. It's important to have building codes. Title 24, California, great job. But that's not enough if you really want to push hard because it is not based on measured performance of the building. And it's not that difficult to measure it, except that there's no requirements so no one measures. Only 5% of the commercial buildings are commissioned. So that means you build a, you build a new building, only 5% actually measured how it performs. 95% go and people occupy and start using it without ever testing. It is like designing a 787 or a 777 Boeing, and someone designs and builds it, and he says, okay, go fly. You don't have to test it. That's the story in buildings. So there's a real lack of policy out here on lack of measurements and policies requiring it, and the building industry is completely fragmented because no one is going for a particular performance. Of course, then there's the grid. You have all these renewables. You want to integrate 50% renewables on the grid. And this, the grid, is what I call the Tesla Edison grid. Because the architecture really has not changed. It is based on the paradigm of centralized generation because it was cheap, long distance high voltage transmission, medium voltage distribution, and then low voltage in your home. That's been the paradigm for the last 120 years. And the power always flowed from the generation only in one direction to the, to the loads. The generation always tracked the load. That means if you turn on a switch out here, some generator had to ramp up. How did they know that the load has been turned on? It's because the frequency went down a little bit. And the frequency was the means. In the, this is, you got to imagine, this is early 1900s. The only way to communicate at that time was frequency. They didn't have any means of communication. You know, the, 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 all the telephones and all were being, being invented at that time. Amazing time, by the way, amazing innovations. The only way to communicate that time was frequency. So we have a few more approaches to communicating nowadays. And we haven't quite used them. I mean, we have a little bit, but we could do better. And I'll show you what. But this grid was never designed for 50% you know, renewables because it was all steady generation. The generation was steady. It always tracked the load. Now we're finding the generations are intermittent. And everyone's talking about the levelized cost of electricity for wind. It is $23, $20 a megawatt hour of solar. It's coming down to you know, $50 a megawatt hour. That's the generation. What is really relevant is not the cost of electricity generation, because you've got to deliver that electricity through the grid, and the grid has to accommodate that. So it's really the cost of electricity delivery, the cost of integration, equally important. You can make solar and wind free. You can't integrate so much. We saw that happen in Germany, and guess what happened? The grid once was almost unstable. So, the, quest, the big question that we have to ask, and no one has figured this out, how can we reduce the cost of integration and maximize the capacity utilization of the solar and the wind? This is an unanswered question. So what are the options? Well, you can add long distance transmission lines. This is really a good deal because you can take care of the variations in wind, for example, and reduce the cost of integration and, and really get it you, you can minimize the cost. That's one option. You can add batteries. So you, you're trying to integrate this intermittency in your, in your wind and solar, and transmission lines will help, 
Or you can add generation, which is, you know, costs money. All of these cost money. You can add batteries. Um, that costs money. Storage is, by itself is not going to solve it. Or you can change the paradigm of the grid by saying, you know what, instead of just the generation following the load, how about the load following the generation? Or just a little bit. Okay? So which one's the best option? We don't know. Is it a combination? Probably. And what is that optimal con combination that will minimize the cost? Depends. But we have to have a framework to analyze and study that. And that's what we are developing right now. What Tesla and Edison did not have, by the way, is this amazing revolution that is happening of digitization. There's a 50-fold increase in digital data that's going to happen between, in the last just 10 years. We're right in the middle of that right now. The amount of investment in trillions of dollars that is going on in the digital world is also bringing down the cost of storage and computing. And the biggest one is what we are now seeing, the partitioning of computing into cloud on one side, which is really utility, frankly, and the devices that we have in our hands and homes and things like that. That's what's going on. And the question is, can we leverage that in some way? And you can see all these industries, the Boeing 787s, produces 40 terabytes per hour. Part of it, half of it is stored in the cloud. You know, the retail industry, the manufacturing, the mining industry is producing. And the grid is now starting to produce the data, and we really haven't utilized it. And so what we're now doing at Stanford is to ask the question, how do we enable the grid? It's not that we're going to throw out this grid and build a new one. We've got a trillion dollars of assets in it. And the question is, can we make it work? And that's the initiative that we are now starting and asking the question, can the load track the generation? If the load has to track the generation, the load has to know that it has to do something. So it needs to have a local intelligence, which I call a local brain. It's pretty cheap nowadays. It's a little computing, which is a network computer with some powerful controller with power electronics. Okay, that can do that. But it's important to have the local brain, but then you need the coordination. It's like if you have Google Maps, okay, I, I, have, I can pull out my phone and I can say, I'm going to go from here to there. And it shows you traffic. How did it know? Well, some other people are also you know, sending the data, and the cloud then looks at that and figures out what the traffic pattern is and tells you the optimal thing. But the cloud is doing that. There's a global coordination that is going on. And that global coordination really has not happened in the grid. And so all these devices, you can think of this as the internet of things. In this case, the things are the power devices. And they need to be connected so that you have global coordination. And the algorithms that do that, some of it is being developed as we speak right here and other places as well. But to put that whole thing together, uh, has not really happened. We're starting to do that. In fact, we are running an experiment right now between Stanford campus and Slack where the generators and loads are talking to each other by the cloud. This is going on. And this is more of this will happen. This is, by the way, this, since it changes the paradigm of the technology and the institutions and the legal framework and everything was based on that paradigm, it's going to change the institution. It's going to change the business models, et cetera. And so this is not just a technical problem. It involves institutions, markets, regulations, and you know, business models. It'll involve consumers. Now you ask the consumers to do a few things, except just turn on the light, and it'll involve them. You have to incentivize them. So this is a fairly complex thing. It's a system level issue. And this initiative we're calling, for the lack of a better term, bits and watts. It's a Stanford initiative, Stanford Slack initiative. And we are now starting to do that. In fact, we have decided whatever software we develop, whatever hardware we develop, the reference designs for that, we'll make it open source. We'll enable everyone. In fact, the first software tool that Ram Rajagopal and his team developed is now in PG&E. They're using it to analyze their data that is coming out from the meters and finding different patterns for loads, which is very important for them for planning. So moving on. The big question, how can we decarbonize? Hopefully, in the future, we will have a grid where the generation is based on nuclear, wind, solar, and some natural gas. 
The mixtures depends on how much you want to decarbonize. And we want to make efficiency on the other end so that you don't need enough of this. It's cheaper that way. And you can see that some part of the transportation will be electrified, but not all. <clears throat> not as of today. We don't have that battery today. And the, we have to figure out how to produce hydrocarbon fuels that are carbon neutral. Now, this may seem counterintuitive, but this is true. This, I think, is one of the biggest challenges of the 21st century. How big is that? Well, let's talk, let's ask the question, what's the most impactful innovation of the 20th century so we understand the scale and the challenge that we are facing out here? This is the biggest challenge. So what was the most important innovation of the 20th century? It's arguable. People may say, oh, it's transistor, integrated circuit. It's airplane, it's space, space travel, it's nuclear energy, it's polio vaccination. You know, you, you could lasers, um, you could washing machine or something, I don't know. <laughs> you, could, you could air conditioning. Actually, if you go to Singapore, they'll tell you air conditioning, right? Which one is the most? And I wondered about this. In fact, I, you know, in the turn of the century, in 1999, when a lot of people were working on Y2K problem, remember Y2K? I used a Mac, I never worried about it. <laughs> so, so I said, okay, let me start reading about, you know, the end of the century, what happened? And I've been only around for 30 something years, what happened before that? And I was surprised to find what was being termed as one of the most impactful innovation of the 20th century. And the story goes back to 1898, when uh, someone by the name of Sir William Crookes, who was the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, called upon science to save the humanity from starvation. Okay, let me set the stage at that time. The population was slowly growing because the quality of water was improving. So people were living longer, but there was not enough nutrition in the soil to grow food. And the fertilizers were natural fertilizers they were getting from these islands in the Pacific, in South America, just off South America, called the Guano Islands. And Guano, in the local language, means bird poop. Okay, so that's a pretty impressive bird out there. <laughs> and these birds pooped, and they made mountains of these, and this is what it looked like at that time. And they would go and dig up these things, and that was the fertilizer because they had contained nitrogen. Nitrogen was key. Because oxygen we get from breathing, hydrogen we get from water, the splitting water. Uh, we get carbon from eating vegetables because carbon is fixed by photosynthesis. Where does nitrogen come from? And that came from some bacteria and organisms in the soil, but it was not enough to maintain the population that was growing at that time. And so there was, you know, there were, there were people were excavating, you know, this is excavating mountains of bird poop. And they were pulling, you know, putting them in bags. They were shipping them. That was the, the Middle East of that time. And then they were you know, selling. They were, this was you know, commercial ads. Look at this. This is going up. And it was a major, major operation. And there were battles between Germany and England and France, whose fish, uh, ships can go faster. And who owns those islands? You know, is, it, is it Peru? Is it Bolivia? Is Chile? And it, this was going on, and of course, things got really smart after a while when Congress got involved <laughs> and created the Guano Island Act of 1856. And it got really smart. What was the act? It was very simple. If you occupy a Pacific island, that is America. <laughs> it solved the immigration problem, by the way. And of course, they occupied, most of them didn't have, but it served a huge purpose in World War II, by the way. Those bases, they, they became bases. So of course, the guano got over after a while. There's only so much bird poop, but by stroke of pure luck, in the Atacama Desert, which is right in Chile, they found another source of nitrogen called nitrate. These are natural crystals of Chilean saltpeter. And then when that got over, it was just right there. 
they went, all the ships went to Chile in the Acoma desert, desert. They pulled up all these things, and, and they were shipping it again. And Sir William Crookes realized that if you do the numbers, that's going to get over at some point. After all, it's a, you know, it's, it's a resource. It's a resource allocation. So what do we do after that? And you know, he was a physicist. He, of course, he put the challenge to the chemists. He said, okay, you guys figure it out now. Because there's so much of nitrogen in the atmosphere. And at that time, there was 1898, after that, there was a huge race amongst the chemists, among the scientists. The Nobel laureates, young guys, all going after this problem. And how to take atmospheric nitrogen and do something with it. And there was a young uh, chemist by the name of uh, Fritz Haber, 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 who um, discovered a catalyst. Incidentally, it was uranium and osmium. This is pre-nuclear. And that at high pressure and high temperature could break the triple bond of nitrogen. It's a very strong bond, extremely stable. Was able to break it and combine it with hydrogen to form ammonia. Once you form ammonia, it becomes a precursor for all kinds of nitrates, et cetera. This was a very big deal. And of course, he got his Nobel in 1918. But that wasn't enough. That was the discovery. But uranium, osmium, I mean, that's it's too expensive. So came an engineer called Carl Bosch, who was at BASF that time. And he looked at that and he said, you know what? I can scale it. And I can make it affordable. In five years, he came up with a process. By the way, this is the birth of chemical engineering, as we know it. And he produced a process that could mass produce this. And this is a, you know, described in a beautiful book called The Alchemy of Air. If you haven't read it, it's worth reading. Because it tells you the science and engineering that was done in the context of the First War and the Second World War. Okay? Fritz Haber was Jewish, and, and Karl Bosch was non-Jewish, but the way they operated, they had to compensate for themselves. And it was a beautifully written book by this. And this became the Haber-Bosch process for nitrogen fixation. Why was it called the most important innovation of the 20th century? Because the nitrogen that was fixed by the Haber-Bosch process is in each one of us out here. We would not be alive for that. And it's the human impact at scale that mattered out here. And you can say, yes, the transistor is very important. Information, internet, it doesn't reach every human being yet. This one did. And that was the whole idea. And this completely changed the ball game. And the Chilean salt pit of factories look like this now. It made it obsolete. So you may ask the question, given the climate and energy challenge that we face today, which is probably even a slightly higher magnitude than the one they faced. What is our Haber-Bosch-like challenge? And I would argue, and then you could argue in many different ways, my way of putting it is that this is the challenge. How do you take CO2 and turn it around and complete the cycle to make it sustainable to make liquid hydrocarbons? As you can see, CO2 has carbon and two oxygen atoms. And you want to strip off the oxygen and make hydrocarbon. So the additional element that you add is hydrogen. And so where does the hydrogen come from? Well, it has to come from water, from splitting water. By the way, this is the fundamental step in photosynthesis. The first step is to split water. And this has to be done in a carbon-free way. So the energy has to come from some carbon-free sources to split the water. Because once you form hydrogen, Hydrogen plus CO2 going to hydrocarbon is about the same level of energy. Most of the energy is, goes into this to form hydrogen. And that hydrogen has to be less than $2 a kilogram. Let me give you some more constraints. Why $2 a kilogram? Because that's when you can make oil at $2 a gallon. OK? So $2 a kilogram. And to get hydrogen at $2 a kilogram, you price of electricity has to be $20 a megawatt hour. You can do the numbers. And now we are seeing and entering an era in the next decade or more, the renewable electricity that will come down. And we hope nuclear will come down to that level. Because if that happens, we have the chance of doing this. Why is it so hard? Why those numbers? 
Well, let me tell you how hydrogen is made today. It is made by taking methane, natural gas, and we have a lot of that out here, and it combining it with water in, in this reaction, which happens at about 1,800,000 degrees Celsius in, in, or over some catalyst at high pressure, and then it produces hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So it has a CO2 burden associated with that and produces hydrogen. And this is very standard. It's called steam methane reforming. And the cost associated with that is the following. If your natural gas, the methane, is at $4 a million BTU, today it's about $3 or something, I don't know the exact price, but it's between two and four. If it's $4, the price of hydrogen is that, that it produces, or the cost of produ production, not the price, the cost of production is about $1.50 per kilogram. So if you want to produce renewable hydrogen without a carbon burn, it has to compete with it. So $1.50 is the marker. Can we get there? This is one of the biggest shells. So what are our pathways? The pathways are that you got water, which is, think of it as, well, it's hard to say that in California, that it's free, but there's a lot of hydrogen there. It's the cost of energy, which is the key, and that has to be carbon-free energy at $20 a megawatt hour. We're getting there, and then we can produce, potentially, hydrogen $1.50. This is just the feedstock. The feedstock is being aligned. It's getting there. Then you have to figure out what is the pathway? And that pathway better be efficient, because if it is not, that cost is going to go up. So this is the challenge that we have. So what, let's talk about the electrochemical pathway, which is what most people are following. A lot of work going on in Stanford on this. Electrochemical is that it's like doing your high school experiment. You put you know, two electrodes, put a battery, and produce hydrogen and oxygen. Well, we know it can be done. The challenge is to do it at $1.50 a kilogram. That is extremely hard. Most of the cost is in the stacks of the electrolyzers that you put. And today, it's at about $5. I can show you. It's at $5. The blue, big blue bar is the cost of electricity. Again, it's the cost of energy. If you get it down to $20 a megawatt hour, we have an outside chance of getting at $2 a kilogram, not at $1.50. So we have a big problem. And the big technical problem is that electrochemistry is done by surfaces. And if you want to increase the yield, you need to port, put more stacks. We don't have a volumetric approach to electrochemistry. So the architecture of an electrolyzer has to fundamentally be different than what we have today. And no one has really invented that yet. And that is a big, big challenge. I'm not going to the depth of the science and engineering, but that is what the challenge is. It's more than the catalyst. People think it's a catalyst. Well, we have pretty efficient catalyst. The catalyst cost is less than 10%. The cost is in the balance of system, in the system level. And that system has to fundamentally change. The other way is the, what is called the thermochemical pathway. That is, and, you know, if you want to take water and directly heat it, you can split water into hydrogen and oxygen. You need more than 2,000 degrees Celsius. We don't have the materials to handle that. So people have been trying to reduce the temperature. How to do that? They use ceramics. And you take a metal oxide and you heat the heck out of it. And you get oxygen out. Okay? It kicks out the oxygen because it's favorable that way. The oxygen likes to be free. And then you get a depleted, oxygen depleted metal oxide. And now it's got oxygen vacancies. It wants to grab oxygen. So you expose it to water. It grabs the oxygen, you get hydrogen. And now you take that and heat that again, and you put that in a cycle. It's called chemical looping. And this is being done today. Uh, there's Will Chue and others who have done this. There's beautiful work done. The problem is that the temperature is too high. The hot temperature is at about 1,500 degrees Celsius. The ceramic that is used today is ceramic is cerium oxide. It's too high. And what is really needed is that one out there is at about 800 degrees Celsius because the whole chemical industry is ready to take 800 degrees Celsius and scale it. And that's one of the research things that we are doing in our lab, we're starting that right now, is how to find the right materials to do this at 800 degrees Celsius because if you can do it, the chemical industry is all about thermochemical and they can adopt it then. And so that's where we're going. It's, you know, we don't know whether we'll succeed or not and get down the cost to about $1.50 a kilogram. If you could do that, this is a big deal then. So big unanswered questions. 
How can we cost effectively integrate intermittent renewable at greater than 50% penetration into our grid? We don't quite know. Our bits and watts will hopefully address that. I don't know whether you'll solve it completely. We'll try to. The second question is, how can we make liquid hydrocarbon fuels out of CO2 at a market competitive cost at 100 million barrels a day? Why 100 million barrels? That's the oil consumption in the world. US is about 20 million barrels multiplied by five. That's 100 million. That's a, that's a world consumption. If you could do it, you've really changed the world. A lot of people say that this is, this is never going to happen. This ah, ah, is too hard and all that. Well, let me just tell you some predictions from the past. I call them famous or infamous, depending on your point of view. And you know, people, when people have said this is impossible, you've got to realize that none of these violate any laws of science. You've got to satisfy the laws of thermodynamics, by the way. You can't violate those. Um, but if you don't violate them, there is a shot. And this is where you know, this famous saying, Lord Kelvin said, radio has no future. X-rays will prove to be a hoax. Heavier than air flying machines were impossible. They never violated the laws of nature. But he still he felt that it, you know, this will never happen. He was very opinionated, but he was wrong. He was able to convince Wilbur Wright in 1901 that man will not fly for 50 years. Luckily, he had a brother, Orville Wright, who combined, who convinced him otherwise. In four years, they were able to fly. Amazing. There was an existence proof. The birds are flying. They're heavier than air. So, so anyway, so this was, and so you can say no, but you've got to be careful. And I, th I think the best way to present what the future ought to be is the, the saying by Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology cannot be distinguished from magic. <laughs> and I think it's for us to figure out that magic and do that magic. And it's for the students and postdocs out here to do that. But I have to end with the great American philosopher. <laughs> and he said this very, and I, I've twisted his saying, I'm an environmentalist because most of my quotes are recycled. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Professor Majumda, for your inspiring and most insightful presentation. Um, I thank you so much. Oh, I hope you are uh, available for a few Sure, questions. of course. I, I will. I'm sure they can add to the top 10 to by 11 and 12 and 13. Yeah. Uh, there's also a, uh, a basal energy of, of deep, dry. Well, mm -hmm. similar to that world, but, but without water, water. That, that is possible today technologies and information yeah. that, is, that, that can bring the price uh, to about... Yeah, so, so the, cost, the cost, this is the question is, if you do geothermal deep borehole and do, instead of liquid, instead of water, use gas. Uh, no, actually, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the insulated. It just, just a, you have one time water, mm -hmm. and it's an insulated tube. Sure. A, you have to have insulation, otherwise you're going to lose that heat. Exactly. But, yeah. the, but, no, but no pumping water. Yeah. No so the cost, the biggest cost, is really the cost of drilling. Right. And, if, and it's, if you could reduce that by technology, in fact, in ARPA, we funded a company called Foro Energy, which used lasers, high power lasers, to weather the rock locally so that the drill bits can last longer. And it's the cost of the drill bits. And uh, it's up and running. It's actually doing really well. And uh, that's the kind of innovation we need to reduce the cost of drilling. I have a quick question, too. Can I uh, just uh, follow up and invite some of our students to ask questions? <coughs> yeah. What are the things you think need to change from a legal and policy perspective that would make your job easier? Oh, carbon price. <laughs> that would, if you can get that done, um, I, would, I would buy you beer at least. <laughs> so yeah, a carbon price. So what George Schultz, Secretary Schultz says is, and I, you know, we all sort of, we agree with him. It's revenue neutral carbon tax, which starts off at, let's say, $10 and ramps up over time. So it gives the business people a signal that if you don't get acting now, it's going to be more expensive in the future. 
Why revenue neutral? Because if you put a tax on oil, um, your price, you, we all, our oil price may go up a little, the gasoline price. So the revenue neutral is take that money and give it back to the people so that they get the benefit. So it's a level playing field for them, but it shifts, tilts the industry. So that, I think, is a really nice way to go about doing it. But trying to get that done in Congress is not going to be easy, at least not in the next year and a half. Uh, hopefully in the next, you know, under the next president we'll, and, and Congress, we can get it done. Yeah. Um, it, I thought I saw at the bottom of one of your charts a dollar fifty or one hundred and fifty dollars a kilowatt hour goal for EV aviation, right? Not aviation. <laughs> All electric cars. All electric cars. Not aviation. Okay. What do you think it'll take for electric aviation? <laughs> for kilowatt hours per, let's say kilowatt hours per kilogram. It's actually if you can make oil, that's a great battery. Yeah, but but I'm I'm, I'm, I'm the battery makers. Uh, it's going to be, it's not so much the co cost, well it is the cost, but it's kilowatt hour per kilogram. Uh, today, you know, so you take lithium ion battery, it's about $400 a kilowatt hour, uh, watt hour per kilogram. Make it factor of 10 higher, and that's, or if at least a five higher. And you could potentially do it with lithium sulfur or lithium air. Um, if you can get it in lithium air, that'll be great. But they're not rechargeable we yet. Rechargeable, ceramics. <laughs> uh, rechargeable yeah. aluminum ox aluminum, yeah, you know, zinc based batteries, aluminum based batteries, yes. Uh, those energy densities are higher. <laughs> Their round trip efficiencies are lower. Um, but yes, I mean, that's the RD. I mean, in RPV, we funded a bunch of these aluminum air, zinc air, rechargeable zinc air batteries, and they're all going. In fact, one of, some of them are being piloted right now for cell tower backup in Indonesia. So there are multiple of these. So I, I think you're, you, we should be investing in the R&D to be a game changer battery in a five to 10 times beyond lithium ion. There's more, way more out there. What does it take to get re, uh, variable reverse pricing uh, coming back so that large scale uh, <coughs> consumers can throttle or ramp up? Ah, well, I mean, you certainly need a market signal. So if, if I'm at home and someone is asking me to dim my lights because I'm serving someone, I need some money. It's very simple. So the pricing signal has to be there. Today's signals, if you look at the retail rates, they are tiered structure in PG&E. And this California PUC commissions, you know, they are now switching to time of use uh, in 2019. There is demand pricing, and there are some time of use tariffs. Yeah, so time of use is, is actually the, f the next step. That means in, you know, in the evening and in the morning, you're going to have higher prices. In the middle of the day, it'll be lower. Uh, ideally, you should have dynamic pricing. Um, and let someone, of course, if there's dynamic pricing, I'm not going to be adjusting things on, on my minute by minute to be able to maximize my dollars. But I will have a system that will look at the signal and automatically adjust my home or my factory to be able to respond to that and thereby minimize my cost. And actually, the pricing, that can be done in an engineering way. It's not a problem. The pricing has to be there to justify that engineering cost of this little gadget that you can have in your home to do that. We, we don't have the market structures yet to do that. Are the, is the barrier tariffs or is there postponed the conversation until then? Yes, uh, you spoke about putting a price on carbon, and I understand the value of that. What well, might be easier to sell? And I read that there's a lot of subsidies that the oil and gas industry gets, getting rid of those. I, I couldn't agree more. I think you should get rid of subsidies for oil and gas. Um, I think um, at some point, I mean, I, my view on subsidies is that if something is getting competitive, you know, give a long term signal that you have a the whole idea of the government, you know, there's a whole big role of the government kind of thing, right? When do you subsidize? When you see the writing on the wall that this is going to get cost competitive at some point, you subsidize to create the competition with other things, but you give a long-term signal that when it gets competitive, there's no subsidy, right? So the long-term signal, predictable signal is very important for the businesses, as opposed to the, like what we have in a production tax credit, on and off, on and off. That's not the way. 
But at some point, you can't survive on subsidies. All of these should be unsubsidized. That's a sustainable way. And so if this oil and gas is competitive, it should, there should be no subsidies. You can apply the same principles to solar and wind when they're cost competitive. And so I think that's the approach that at least I would take in this um, across the whole energy sector, not just oil and gas. Yeah. One last question. Okay. We Some have. students up there. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No, no. To you. Um, okay. Well, let's take the students first. That's two students. Yeah. yeah. In order to uh, reduce environmental impact of the power sector, um, you mentioned some long-term strategies. In the short term, let's say the next 10, 15, 20 years, do you think a push toward renewables or replacing coal by natural gas is more uh, viable to reduce environmental impacts? Uh, you know, you can't, it's like asking me, you've got two daughters, who do you pick as a favorite? No, they're both important. Um, first of all, I think you have got to make your energy demand much more efficient, the demand side, so that you use less. Then decarbonizing with, nat with coal, with replacing with natural gas, it's happening economically because it's just cheaper. And no one is building a new coal-fired power plant now, at least in the United States. So that's happening. Um, and you know, renewables, yes, I mean, you gotta have some renewables, and frankly, the grid can accommodate up to about 20%, you know, 25% doing that in California with renewables. Beyond that, it's difficult. Um, but I think you gotta sort of do all of that, and it's not just one thing. Uh, so you mentioned that we have about a trillion dollars in assets in our grid, and so it's not something we should just abandon. But if we could build it over again, or looking at developing nations where they're really just becoming electrified, would you recommend a centralized model or a more distributed grid? Oh, uh, great question. I would recommend a distributed, because now you can put a solar panel, a little, some storage, and you can, you're up and running. And I would have microgrids um, which will, are backward compatible, which will, when the grid shows up, then you can connect to it and sell electricity to the macro grid. So I would do it in a very different way. I mean, you think about it. People are taking the Tesla and Edison grid and trying to make it smarter. What are they actually doing? Well, they're putting sensors at the edge of the grid, which is your smart meters at home, and in the center of the grid, which is your PMUs in the transmission lines. We really don't know what happens in the distribution network. Okay, and so this, these sensors are now producing data. We don't know what to do with it. That's not what I would define as smartness. <laughs> what I would do is to design the smartness from the bottom up and make it smart from the beginning. Put power electronics in it, have it networked so that you can now communicate with the different nodes and, and, and that's how the microgrid that I would develop. I guess implicit in this whole discussion has been that we don't want to throw any more CO2 into our atmosphere. Uh, but it seems like there's a lot of coal and oil around to keep burning if we wanted to. And it will take some time to switch anyway, so there will be more emissions coming pretty much no matter what you do. So why the focus so much on ways to move away from uh, burning to make CO2 versus sequestering CO2 that uh, or even that's already in the atmosphere and might be somehow taken out. Well, I mean, I think if you can get carbon capture to be low cost, the reason I said $30 a ton uh, to decarbonize a coal-fired power plants is because you can sell it today for enhanced oil recovery. Now, whether that's a good thing or not, that's debatable. But at least for sequestration, if there's no carbon price, people are not going to sequester. Okay, it's just, you know, it's cost. And so you need a carbon price. And $30 a ton... Today it's about $70, $80 a ton for post-combustion capture from coal-fired power plant. And you know, if you could reduce it a little bit more, it needs materials and chemical innovation. Um, and so that's, I think it's very important to do that because as we know today, now, you know, there's CO2 being emitted, China, India, and other places from coal-fired power plant. That's a growth industry out there. And Germany, by the way. And so that's very important to do the carbon capture and sequester. But you, again, this is not a one-off thing. You've got to do that and a few other things as well. I guess the last question. Okay. All right. One of the, sorry, the big problem with nuclear power is that a lot of uranium in a small spot 
and if things go wrong, they really go wrong. With big batteries, you know, you're concentrating lithium in deadly poison, tons of it in one spot. What is being done or what thought is being given to either recycling it or prevention or mitigation of a, a potential accident? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think from the accident point of view, it seems to me the car industry is paying a lot of attention to that because you know, Tesla and Nissan essentially will be out of business if there's some major fires in lithium-ion batteries. Uh, they're all kind of testing that goes on. And so I think any time you store energy, you've got a potential for explosion. And the question is, and that's true for gasoline as well, and we have had that history. And we continue, we made it, improved it, made it better and better. And now, frankly, it's much safer than what it used to be with, with Ford Pintos and things like that, right? And right now, it's a question of can we make lithium-ion batteries safer and safer? That's the work that is going on in many of these auto companies. Um, and you know, I think you've got to sort of think about it from a technical point of view, can it get it done? And what about, what about at the end of the life? That's a good point. The recycling part is very important. Uh, it's not that we have, we have lack of lithium. I mean, there is lithium out there. But the question is, do you really want to go to Bolivia and use it and, and, and scoop out all the lithium? Or could we take our old batteries and extract out the lithium? And frankly, I'm not sure enough has been done about that. And I think we need to certainly pay attention not that you said there's nothing has been done. People are looking at extracting lithium out of you know, various compounds, oxides and all that, which is the cathode material. But you know, can more be done? Absolutely, yeah. Let's thank Professor Majumdar again. Thank you.